Okay, welcome to our session for today. Today we're going to be covering Active King, Active Pieces. It's going to be our great title. This lecture is obviously brought to you by Cape Town Chess Academy. So first question for today. How many points is the king worth? Do you know, Anita? Yeah, it's actually a valuable piece, but in the end game, it counts four. Four, yeah. Do you know why? Next question. This is fun. Let's do this quickly. Quickly, quickly. Um, so the whole theory of how we know the value of pieces, let me discuss this quickly. We have the knight here. The way we measure this is we cut the board in half effectively. So from here, we can see our knight has six possible moves. Three, four, five, and six. To place it anywhere in this half of the board, and if we're only looking at half of the board, there would be six possible moves. Let's change this now. Let's look at, say, a bishop. If we look at a bishop, again, we cut the board in half. We have six possible moves. So the way we get the value of the piece is we effectively divide that by two. So if I create another chapter, we put a king here. The king we see has eight moves. So the king is almost stronger than a minor piece in a lot of situations. So this game we're going to look at first here. We have a game between Kirill Alexienko and Alexander Grishuk. This game actually took place yesterday at the candidates tournament, which is currently ongoing. Alexienko is white and Grishuk is playing black. We see e4, e6, d4, and d5. There's characterizing the French defense. We get knight c3, the classical variation. Now black has a few choices. He can play bishop to b4, the winner. He can take, play the Rubenstein. He could play knight f6, which is what he chooses to do. And we get the Steinitz variation after e5. Knight fb7. White goes f4, securing his center. Black continues with c5. Knight f3, knight c6, and bishop e3. This is all very common theory. We are not going to look at all the subtleties going on in the opening because that isn't the focus of our lecture today. Black now takes, and off the knight takes, he plays queen b6. And this is the poison pawn variation of the French. I don't know if any other people yeah, check were watching or following the candidates. There was this poison pawn, and we also saw the poison pawn knight off yesterday as well. White plays queen d2, giving black the b2 pawn in exchange for speedy development. The queen is forced back to a6, and the bishop comes to b5. We get knight takes d4, bishop takes d4, a6, bishop takes d7, and bishop takes d7. Rook to b3, chasing the queen away before capturing the pawn. So now whites effectively regain their pawn, but we have a very interesting position going on here. So first, second question of the day, Mr. Nito, which side would you rather choose here? White or black? You can have some time to think if you need it. I would, I would um, choose white. You would choose white. Any particular because, reason? Uh, oh, yeah, because um, my, 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 all my pieces are active. Um, the white king is, uh, can castle sword. Um, and um, yeah, I have a pass pawn, a potential pass pawn. Yeah. And yeah, and, and if I, if I, if I um, look at black, um, his uh, rooks are still in the in that same position. Mm -hmm. um, only active pieces I can see is the bishop and the queen. The uh, black bishop is still um, snoozing on 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 its own um, square, uh, and the king is in the middle still. And it's not there isn't a potential for him to castle. So, yeah, I think uh, white has a slight uh, advantage. Okay, thank you for that. That was a very Nice analysis. It's actually interesting because all those points you mentioned are definitely right. Black is under the pump a little bit with his development. 
His main advantage is that he has two bishops. So he's trying to say, okay, he has two bishops. He maybe has the better pawn structure too, because we could see one day the C pawn being weak, whereas white has a space advantage and white is better developed. Black chooses to go queen h4 here. Now white again as a choice. A lot of players, yeah, they play bishop f2, just obviously stopping the check, and the queen can still protect the f pawn. You do not in this position usually want to play something like g3 because black can just play queen h3 and you have a lot of potential to end up with a bad bishop. And if black ever somehow manages to get rid of this deep one, we could imagine this bishop being a monster on the diagonal. So instead, white chooses to play queen f2. We get queen trades and bishop e7. Black just wants to complete his development as quickly as he can. Again, if there's any questions, you are welcome to stop me at any point. I do see we have some more people joining us. We are just looking at a game that happened yesterday in the candidates. Knight d1. Now, knight d1 is a very interesting move. I don't know if it's a move I would have necessarily thought of first. He understands that his c-pawn could be potentially weak. So he wants to prepare to play the c4 pawn break. Bishop d8 is played. Again, black just wants to manage to engineer. Uh, sorry, hmm? sorry, Michael, Coach Michael. Yeah. Uh, you say um, white uh, says that uh, that pawn is probably a potential weakness. Yeah, the c uh, Isn't it maybe he thinks that he has a fast pawn, a, pot a potential Pass pawn for, for queening, maybe, and maybe clear the way for the pawn, maybe, or am I looking at uh, so you're wrong. saying that this pawn is a potential pass pawn? Is that what you're saying? Yes, okay, that it could be, but the problem is, whenever you play c4, more likely than not, he's going to take it, and there's no way to ever pass black's d pawn, so he is going to play c4, which I gave he ever play c4 and black can't capture for some reason that that pawn is definitely a potential pass pawn but for now i would say there's more of a threat of black playing rook c8 and targeting this pawn as a weakness would be my assessment like of course okay it is something that strength yeah, and weaknesses mean, yeah. but i think it's yeah. more of a weakness than a strength mm. he continues 93 trying to play c4 as we mentioned Bishop c6. This is Black's clever way of making sure he can finally complete development, get his king to safety. The rook drops back. Note the rook does not drop back to b1. He rather comes back to b2 so that he can play rook b1 now. And double up and take control of the position. Black castles. We get bishop c5 thrown in, harassing the black rook. The rook comes to e8. And now we get c4, which is c4. This is a very critical moment of the game. I think it's important we also look what move is at. This is a move 22. If any of you have watched much chess, Alexander Grishuk and Kyo Alexienko both have terrible time management skills. So they were both pretty close to time trouble already. Yeah. Black chose to go f6. I am just going through this quite fast, even though it is fascinating stuff because I want to primarily focus on the end game. White chooses to capture, pawn takes, and now bishop d6. So it's a very weird position at this stage. Black trades on e5. And we effectively have both sides having central pass pawns that could prove to be strengths or weaknesses, depending on how we see things. Black still has two bishops, which could be a nice advantage for him. And he plays d4, making sure this bishop is active. When you're playing with Two bishops, you want to open the position as much as possible because that's when your bishops are going to be the strongest. Knight f5 gets played by white. We get d3. Again, black is wanting to preserve that pawn and one day dream of queening it. King e3. This is where our first theme and the reason I chose this game comes in. White is trying to prove that he is a piece up effectively now that sounds very weird because i know some of you missed the 
start of my lecture where I was discussing how the king is in some situations stronger than a minor piece. And this, I believe, is one of them. The white king is getting active. The white king is going to be in the center of the board. He's going to be contributing to the fight. Whereas the black king is going to be cowardly stuck back here. Let's see how the game plays out. Bishop b5, just securing the d3 pawn. King e4. The king marches up to the center, firmly in control of the position. We get rook to c8. Knight comes back to d4. Again, they are slowly approaching the time control. How this tournament works is you get more time once you reach move 40. You get like an extra half an hour or 40 minutes, something like that. We get bishop to c4. Rook comes to d1. A5, A3, and now G6. Rook B7 is played. And now what move did Black play to take advantage of White's King maybe being slightly vulnerable? Maybe if somebody can give me an answer, you're welcome to type it in the chat or just unmute. hide the answers here so no one tries to pull a sneaky on me it's not some game winning tactic it's just a way black can improve one of his pieces I'll give you guys some time to think about it Mr. Sechela, you got an answer? Or shall I pick on Anita again? Uh, I think uh, Bishop um, G5. Bishop G5. So G5 is interesting. You're wanting to say you're going to support this pawn. Is that the plan? Yeah, but I also want to connect my rooks. They're not um, connected at the moment. So okay. just to play that bishop out, um, giving my attention to to the pawn. But uh, actually, uh, I'm not actually giving my attention to that pawn because the pawn is not going anywhere. Okay. But just to connect my rooks, you know. Um, I like yeah. the idea behind it. The idea is definitely right. I'm actually curious if this is just as good as the move played in the game because it's very much the same plan. I don't see some quick master plan i can play yeah so yeah i like i like bishop g5 it's a nice move what was played was bishop f6 which is the same thing as bishop g5 maybe looks a bit cooler it does force white well it doesn't force white but eventually he's going to be forced to do something he plays knight f3 which okay one it over protects his pawn now it's protected three times and the white king can now is the square on d4 potentially the game continued bishop g7 black doesn't want to blunder some position where white can simply take that bishop we get rook to a7 rook comes to d8 like anita was mentioning now that those rooks are connected it's very nice king d4 gets played bishop comes to b3 now i want a move this is a very interesting move that was now Played by white. Move that probably wouldn't be possible if his king wasn't as active as it was. Just look for any plan that could potentially change the nature of the position. I'll once again, give you people some time to think about it. If you come to answer, you're welcome to type it in the chat or just unmute yourself. Is it the white's move or play? Yeah, it's white to play. Okay.
I think one thing that might help you come to the solution is black is a threat here. What is black threatening? Black is threatening one of our pieces. What is he threatening? Uh, it's, it's the rook. So he has to move the rook. So it um, is threatening oh. another one of our pieces besides the rook. Yeah, the bishop. Yeah. And the bishop is threatened because there is this pin going on here. So yeah. our king is active, but it's also being a slight hassle at the moment because it's maybe active slightly earlier than we'd want. So we need to save those two pieces, and that isn't as easy as it looks. anybody have an idea or should we look at the move that was played can i presume nobody has anything but um, mm -hmm. if, if the rook takes the pawn in what will happen rook takes pawn aren't you walking into this door yeah like that's well, a piece it's right not gonna work. No, yeah it's, so that's... It, it's not gonna work it's not what i was was imagining <laughs> I'm seeing stuff now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, okay, one thing that could be thought of, which I don't think is right, is if you try something like rook b1, and then after bishop c2, you can try and protect your bishop. But I'm still slightly worried about this pawn being quite a nuisance. And our pieces feel a bit weird trying to protect each other now. So the move that was played by Alexienko is a really interesting one. He took this bishop. Rook takes g7. King takes g7, and rook takes d3. So now white has a pawn and a knight for a rook. But I would argue he also is almost up a king, because his king is contributing significantly more than the black king at the moment. If we look at the move now, I will also once again point out this is move 37, so they didn't have much time on their clock, because they want to get to move 40, where they get more bonus time. We get a four is played, just securing the bishop. And now white starts maneuvering. We get knight d2. He wants to maybe bring that knight to e4, maybe capture a bishop. There's a lot of possibilities. Black drops the bishop back to e6. And the knight comes into e4, just slowly improving his pieces. And the thing is, I remember I was watching the commentary on this game. Magnus Carlton was doing some of it, which was quite interesting. And he talked about how a bishop secured by a pawn in an endgame is worth about the same as a rook. Which I've found quite interesting. Because this bishop is very much restricting the black's rook's activity. And this pass pawn always has to be worried about. Bishop f5 gets played. Rook comes to e3. Bishop takes e4. Rook takes d4, e4. So at this point, they've now reached the time control. They each have an extra 30 minutes or so on their clock. Rook f8 is played. No, Grishuk did not blunder his rook. There is a pin going on here. King e3, stopping any infiltration. As much as we want our king to be as active as possible, sometimes it has other jobs to do. Rook comes back to e8. Very sneaky. We can't take on a4 because rook will take on d6 and there's a pin, right? So again, always got to watch out for those pins. King f4. Rook a8 gets played. Now black does have to protect the pawn. Rook to b4. And rook to a7. Guarding against any infiltration on the 7th rank. King e4. White continues to keep his king as active as possible. King f7. And rook b6. Rook b6 is played. So that if, for example, black chooses to go king e6, what move can white play here? Bishop b8. Yeah, bishop b8. And we have a discovered attack going on. So you see, white understands what black is trying to do. Black is trying to activate his king, but white does not want to allow that. Rook c8 and bishop b4. Just dropping the bishop back to a more secure square. Black doubles up. 
Now king d5. The white king keeps on marching into the position. We get rook c2. White allows black to activate with the hopes that his own central pawn will cause more of a problems for black. King f6. And now rook b7. It doesn't matter that white has done an exchange because his king is so much better. This black king is already in danger of maybe getting even mated one day. We could imagine a world where a4 and, oh, sorry, my arrows are bad, and rook f7 comes with mate. So he chooses to play g5, preventing any of those shenanigans from happening. We get rook takes h7, rook takes g2, and king d6. King keeps marching up the board. King g6 is played. The rook comes all the way back to h3, just over protecting this pawn, preparing to one day maybe cycle back into the game. Black pushes his pawn. He wants to stir up some counterplay. The rook comes to e3. There's a very famous rule, rooks belong behind pass pawns. Because when you put your rook behind a pass pawn, it's a lot better than in front of the pawn. Because if you're behind the pawn, every time you push the pawn, your rook starts controlling more and more squares. Whereas if it's in front of the pawn, your rook gets less active when you're pushing the pawn. Rook takes h2 gets played. And king d7. The king just keeps marching on. Black has to come back with the rook to stop the pawn. And e7. The pawn has made its way all the way to the seventh rank. Rook e8 gets played to make sure that pawn gets blockaded. And now just bishop d6. This bishop is just going to worm its way in here to secure the pawn. And black will always have to worry about his eighth rank. Rook a8. Bishop c7. Now black chose to go rook a g8, which apparently is a mistake. The correct plan for black is just to sit tight in this position. So after saying like king c5, if white goes bishop d8 or something, he can try and stir up enough counterplay for this pawn. But instead, he put the rook on this side of the board, which has the problem that now this a pawn is going to be weak. Rook e4 gets played, immediately targeting the pawn. King to f5. He just throws in rook f4 check. The king goes back to g5, and now he gobbles up the pawn. Again, this white king is already here yeah, trying to support the promotion. The black king still needs like three tempo to be able to help his pawn. He chooses to go now king h4. Rook back to e4 is played. And the rook now chooses to come back here. Yeah, because otherwise there was always the risk of something like this happening. And this pawn just running way too fast for black. Rook a8. A4. King to g5, a5, rook to h7, and simply king c6, having nasty ideas of doing this. The rook goes back to h8 to support his rook. King goes back to d7. They kind of pretend they're going to make a nice draw. And then white says, no draw for you. He wants to win the game. Rook e3. The rook comes to e8. Black has nothing to do but to defend passively. We see White's bishop does a fantastic job of controlling Black's pawn, and he protects the A pawn. In fact, the combination of White's king and bishop is far more valuable than a rook at the moment. King d7, king to f6, rook e6, king f7, rook comes back to e4, just targeting the pawn. Of the king f6, can anyone find the killing move for that white can play here? How can we finish this game quickly? You can do a, what I like to call an ESCOM maneuver where he cuts the electricity. How can we cut the electricity between these two rooks? Um, play bishop. Bishop. 
Bishop d8. Yeah. That's what was played in the game. And after one more move, Black chose to resign. Yeah, because okay, the king just comes to f8. He's gonna queen, and that is a long time before the black pawn can queen. So this was a very nice game that I kind of noticed while preparing for this lecture, and I thought I would show it because it did just happen yesterday. Which White had this very nice concept where the king being active and having a bishop and a pawn for the rook is far more valuable than just being equal material. If there's no more questions on this game, we'll move on to the next one. Again, you're welcome to type any questions in chat or unmute yourself. Yes, Anita. Oh, the question, how do you know when to activate your king? When to activate your king. Is it That's... when, when the, 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 the queen is off the board or? Okay, most situations you're not going to want to activate your king when the queen is on the board. So that is definitely true. When to activate it when the queens are off? I can give you the great cop-out answer, which is you activate your king when its value in being active is worth more than the risk of it getting checkmated. So if we look at this, like when White started activating his king, uh, all the way back a like year even, it's not immediately clear that the king is better in the center of the board, right? Because we permanently saw black exploiting these pins but ultimately having the king there allowed white to take a lot of liberties so it's something that's different on each of the situations but generally the rule of thumb is you activate the king in the end game everyone has their own definition of what an end game is the one that i always like to believe is that it's when the material for each side is like under 13 points so yeah, we see black as 16 points. So I would classify this as closer to a middle game, but obviously grandmasters know what they're doing. And he assessed that his king was safe here, even though it was sometimes a bit vulnerable. I hope that answers your question as best as I can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. How much time do we have? Let's, yeah. We'll probably skip the last game. Or do I want to skip this game? I'm trying to think now. It was a fun game. Uh, this game's relatively interesting. Oh, let's have a look at this. We'll go quite quickly because I do want to get through all these examples I have. We get d4, knight f6, c4, and e6. Knight f3, d5, knight c6. We get a queen's gambit. Clearly, Mr. Aliekin had watch the Netflix show, bishop b7, bishop g5, and castles. This is all very normal stuff. e3, knight bd7, rook c1, and c6. We could have also seen white do something like take here, and we'd have got a Carl's bad pawn structure, which you would know how to play if you attended our lecture a few weeks ago on Carl's bad pawn structures. But he instead chose rook c1. And after c6, black almost has a Slav defense set up for this kind of pyramid thing. Get queen c2, rook e8, and bishop d3. White's just developing naturally. d takes c4, bishop takes c4, and knight d5. Black seeks to trade off pieces. Again, black doesn't have a space advantage. So he wants, when you have less space, you want to trade off pieces. White goes knight e4. He wants to avoid some trades. He is willing to trade off the dark sword bishop. We get f5, which okay, is a very dodgy move played here. But this game was quite a while back. And not too many people have heard of Fred Yates. So I don't think he was the best player around. A better idea would probably have just been to go something like h6. And just keep your position solid. F5, it weakens this E6 pawn and specifically this diagonal a bit too much. Bishop takes E7, Queen takes E7, and Knight ED2. White is just content to play solidly. He now has this advantage of having a better bishop than his opponent because his bishop is on the opposite color to his central pawns. That means our bishop, our pawns don't get in the way of our bishop. 
Whereas if we look at Black's bishop, these pawns are in the same color and they're getting in the way. B5 is played. We get bishop takes D5. White has no problems parting with his bishop. Now in this position, which piece would white like to exchange? Somebody tell me which minor piece would white like to exchange to make his job as easy as possible. Who can I pick on his Then knight on d2. Yeah, the knight on d7, we would like to trade for a knight on d2. Because once we do that, we would have a knight against a bad bishop and our knight would look very pretty and be a lot better than the black bishop. White first castles, a5 gets played. Now he goes knight b3. As Tekutswa said, he just wants to trade off his knight. So knight to c5 is coming. So after a4, knight c5, knight takes, queen takes, queen takes, rook takes. And I would already say at this stage, white is winning the game. And if you have a position like this with the white pieces, you should be converting this. Even though you're not up any material, this knight is going to be so much better than black's bishop ever will be. Also, you can control the open file. That's two advantages. There's always that saying you need two advantages to win a game of chess, and white definitely has those here. B4 is played. Rook fc1, seizing control of the file. Bishop a6. And now knight e5. Now all of white's pieces are very well placed. Black chooses to just play rook b8. Now f3. f3 is a very quiet move, which I didn't think much of when I first saw it. Black continues with his plan of pushing the king side, b6. What should white do in this position? Does he want to keep the queen side open or closed? Keep it closed. Yeah, you definitely want to keep it closed. Black is set up to play here. So if you do something like takes this already, he could take off the pawn as well. This lets black get active. So the right move is simply to push a3. h6 gets played. Black's running out of ideas. Now king of two. And this is the difference you'll see between a lot of strong players and those who are maybe not so strong. Strong players understand when their opponent can't be doing anything and they don't rush. Yo, white sees, okay, black has not really got much of a plan. If he ever starts bringing this king around, he's going to have to worry about knights, checks everywhere. So he thinks, let's just improve my king and black has very little to do. Black goes king h7. So if we look at this position, what is the one move that black could consider playing that might or might not improve his position. If it's Black's to move again, what move do you think Black would play? Can I get some ideas here? There's probably two moves that, to me, would need to be considered. What moves would Black play? It is White's move now, but we need to understand what our opponent's plans are so we can know how to stop them. I think Black will want to trade off the rooks. Okay, trading off the rooks is one of the ideas I was thinking of, so good job. Let's just make a move that does nothing. Let's do this. If you trade off the rooks, which, okay, you're trading two active rooks for two passive rooks. The problem is this end game is so easy for Black. Uh, for White, I mean. Because White is just going to run his king up these dark squares. The bishop's going to get tied to this pawn. If it even can, you'll probably have to do something like this to protect the pawn. Right, let's make some moves quickly. Let's just say, I don't know, does check. Okay, maybe my move wasn't so good because now I'm allowing you to do this. So maybe I should, instead of going a3, say b3 or something. If we trade these rooks, takes, takes, takes. This clearly illustrates how much how important the active king is. Because the black king is kind of doing nothing. Yeah, let's just say he starts coming back. 
already now you have to worry a lot about this pawn. So let's say we put this bishop on this diagonal to protect the pawn. The bishop comes back here. And the, either now we have two options, we can do this, which is probably easiest, or we can activate the king even more. And white just wins this so easily because he's he's, the knight completely controls the position and the king is more active. So the plan I was thinking of, I, this was also a very good idea, thank you for that, is that black might be looking to play g5, just gaining some space. It's not even the greatest move around, but white doesn't even let him get that. He just goes h4. And the idea behind h4 is now he can look to put the king on f4. And little by little, he's making his position better, while black cannot make any improvements to his position. Black chooses to go rook f8, and now we get king g3. Black just puts the rook back. There's nothing black can do. It's very hard for him to find a move. White goes rook c7. Again, white is making progress. His rooks are now getting better. The bishop comes to b5. Rook comes to c5. Again, white's continuing to improve. Bishop comes to a6. And the rook just nudges up a little bit more. Rook comes back to e8. Again, this pawn was under threat. And the king comes to f4. Now things are kind of getting complete. We've improved our king to the fullest. Our knight is fantastic. Both our rooks are very active. King g8 gets played. And h5. Again, white has somehow made 15 moves in a row that is improving his position while black had nothing that he could do. Bishop comes to f1. Hitting the pawn, white just moves it. And white's position gets even better because now this pawn can't be targeted. The bishop drops back. Black hasn't made any progress in a very long time. The rook comes into f7, preparing to double in the seventh rank. King comes to h7, and just rook c7. Now this is a massive problem. Black is forced to go rook g8. Now, can someone tell me what maneuver white can use to break through black's defense? You can take some time to think. Isn't as easy as it might look, even though white is completely dominating. Mr. Burton, maybe, you got an idea? maybe, 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 maybe,
anyone see how White can win this position? Black resigned in two moves from you. Nobody have any ideas. Tukuts was quiet. Benito's quiet. Burton's quiet. <laughs> I don't. I don't see it, Michael. Don't see it. Okay, let's have a look at the answer. It's just you take your chest is an easy game. Can you see what happens after Rook takes you? It has to do with the theme of our lecture. <laughs> hint, hint, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Well, the king, the king, <laughs> king must move. <laughs> king e5 and the rook strapped. Which. Because if the rook goes back to f8, this is mate. And the whole reason white was actually able to break through was because the king is here. Otherwise, you can't give him your knight and it would just be a draw. But the fact that the king can immediately step in here just means white wins. Which, okay, the thing I loved about this game was just how patient white was improving his position. Because we saw even at the end, after all these improvements, it was still difficult to break through. So if you feel like your opponent is squeezing you, still keep trying. Like it still can be difficult to win, even if your position isn't that good or doesn't look good. Okay, any questions or should we move on to the next game? This next example that we're going to look at is probably one of my favorite chess games. If there's no questions, I presume, then we are good to move on. Okay. Nigel Short against Jan Taman, two very famous players. Uh, okay, none of them play anymore. This game was played in 1990 when they were both in the top 10 in the world. Nigel Short is playing white. E4, knight of six, and E5. They play the Aliekin's defense or Alekine's defense as it's pronounced here commonly, even though it's the wrong pronunciation. Knight D5 d4 d6 knight of three i'm gonna go quite fast through the opening g6 if you have any questions again you're welcome to stop me as we go along bishop c4 knight to b6 hitting the bishop the bishop comes back to b3 and bishop g7 queen e2 gets played knight c6 castles and castles both sides are just completing development normally h3 gets played to prevent black from coming off his bishop to g4 a5 and a4 white does not want his bishop to be kicked away d takes e5 d takes e5 and knight d4 again when you're playing with a space disadvantage when you have less space on your side of the board you want to trade pieces and that's exactly what black does he trades off a pair of knights now, rookie one is played, securing the e-pawn, and e6. After e6 is played, which of black's pieces is now very sad? One of black's pieces is very, very sad now. Uh, white bishop. Yeah, and the bishop is now blocked by this e6 pawn. There is maybe the potential idea of one day doing something like bishop d7 and bishop c6, but if you try that immediately, you might run into like some tactic of rook d1 winning the bishop. So that bishop is now blocked in. White goes knight d2. Black puts his knight in the center on d5. And knight of three. White is just trying to finish development. Queen comes to c5. And queen e4, centralizing the queens. So question here. Whose king do you think is safer in this position? White or black?
I don't know. They both look quite safe. They both yeah. look quite safe. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I think uh, white is more safe. Okay, so we have a vote for that. Both safe and a vote for white's king is safe. I would agree with Anita, unfortunately, Mr. Burton. You do have this fianchetto set up, which is often very solid with the bishop guarding these dark squares. The problem is, why does this annoying pawn on ether? We can imagine a position where white manages to somehow trade these dark squared bishops, and then this queen and knight will just start wrecking havoc on the black king. If black was able to keep a knight on f6, there would never be any attack, and the black king would even be safer. So with this knowledge, black tries to trade queens. He goes queen b4. And white realizes, okay, his opponent's trying to trade queens. That means he does not want to trade queens. So he plays bishop c4, putting a bishop in the way. Black goes knight to b6. He thinks, okay, surely now white is forced to trade queens. But white plays b3. Which, okay, when I first saw this, this was crazy to me. Because after knight takes, he takes with a pawn. This guy never attended any lessons on pawn structure in his life. These pawns are just all now terribly weak. What is this? But he is saying, okay, the attack that he's going to get is worth more than the damaged pawn structure. So black plays rookie eight, having the idea, okay, queen could come back, bishop could come back freeing up the square mainly. Rook d1 gets played. And just queen to c5. Just putting the queen on a different square. You sidestep any potential rook b1s down the line. You sidestep some bishop d2s. And you maybe even have the idea of trying to play queen c6 and pestering white for that queen trade. Queen h4. Now we see the beginning of the plan. White wants to attack on those dark squares. G, b6 gets played, bishop to e3, gaining a tempo on the queen, and then queen bishop to h6. What should black play in this position? There's probably only one move that stops you from being in a lot of trouble. And even then, you're still in a lot of trouble. It stops you from having to resign immediately. What move is that? Maybe we should first look at what it isn't. If you take this, the queen will take and white now threatens knight to g5. The only move to stop knight g5 is to play saying bishop b7, and you think this is checkmate. If the white knight moves, and white can simply play rook to d4, and this rook is coming here and that's going to be mate. So that's not fun. So you cannot take this bishop. So what else can we do? To Kutzra, you have any bright ideas? Anita, maybe? No? no. Uh, I, will, I, I won't take the bishop. I will just leave it like that. Okay. And... What do you want to play? Um... Any move, let's say. What, what can we play to pass a move? Bishop e7, that yeah. looks good. Yeah, I think that's the, the only I mean, good move right yeah. now. Or, yeah, I think mm -hmm. that's the only thing. But just to, to, like you demonstrated, to take that bishop is going to be bad. So I would rather take him. And then uh, if if I take my uh, the, the king, take the bishop, then I can maybe still have some running away space. Yeah. Okay, that is definitely better. I think you are still in trouble after I take this. I can probably now go queen f6. You have to go like king g8, right? And, okay, I'm trying to think now what's the easiest way I can win this. If it's, so it's something like rook d4 again. It gets very unpleasant. I don't know if there's a better way, way I can do this. Let me cheat quickly. Don't, don't do this at home. Let's turn on. See what my computer says about taking a king takes, queen f6, king g8, and then it wants to go rook d4, like I said. 
and and then play h5 we go h5 i think i can even go something like g4 computer wants to go knight h4 i don't understand that but okay you know let's look at this for the computer off like what are you doing you understand like i don't see how black does anything and eventually i'm gonna at my leisure open this up with g4 or i'm gonna play knight h4 and i might even want to try and put a rook on g3 to stop mate might be the easiest way and the moment i can stop worrying about that checkmate threat i think you'll be the one getting checkmated but yeah. again maybe this yeah. works yeah i don't know what was played and i think is a better move is bishop to h8 just keeping the bishop on which again makes a lot of sense the problem is white will still trade the bishops eventually rook d8 was played in the game now bishop e7 and rook a d1 Now he felt he had to go bishop g7, which is kind of funny because if we take, basically, I believe we're threatening, threatening a lot of things. Is it just queen e7 we're threatening? I think it's queen e7, and that's going to be checkmate because there's no way to simply deal with all the threats. Uh, Michael, hmm? is it possible? Can you just go back again to that uh, question this you position. asked? Yes, I just want to fix something earlier. No, okay. What are you looking at? If you take, if the bishop takes the white board, mm. I'm just, I'm just, you that know. That is a piece. Uh, so. uh, uh, Oh, I thought the, the bishop was behind the queen. That was fine. Okay. No, that, that would be nice, but we are at tempo too slow for that. Yeah. So what got played was bishop h8. There it came, yeah. And now he was forced to go bishop g7 anyway to prevent problems on the back rank. The best part of this game is still coming. It's a really cool ending. White chooses to keep his rook on the board. Again, when you're attacking, you don't want to trade pieces. When you're attacking or have more space, in this case, white has space and he's attacking, so he really doesn't want to trade pieces, except for the key defenders of the black king, like this dark squared bishop. Rook f8. Bishop takes g7. King takes g7. And rook comes to d4. Just, again, improving the position of his pieces. Now... It played as rookie eight, queen f6, and king g8. Like, it's again very hard for white to find any move that seems productive. Like, and maybe this pawn is hanging, but you always have to worry about this pawn, and then he's on your bishop, and it's not pleasant. White has complete control of this open file. So, what white does, he just plays h4, slightly improving his position. And black goes h5. And this is the key moment of the game. Because when I show this game to people, I always tell them it's mate and four from you. And usually the first thing they're like is let's go g4. And then I tell them they're hanging their knight. And then after that, they struggle to find another move that they think will lead to a checkmate. Well, it's not mate and four, but the game was over in four. So I misspoke there. But can anyone come up with a plan now that white can play? That will give him a decisive advantage. I think. Uh, mm -hmm. What are you thinking? No, no, no. No, I see now that the rook is protecting the. Oh, you were wanting to do some shenanigans yes. over here. Yes. I mean, I think if you take here, takes. And then queen. that check, like the queen is, yeah. the rook is going to, yeah. Is protected by the queen. A nice idea, though. I like the thought. Anyone else got another idea?
You guys really don't read the title of my lectures, do you? <laughs> King, King H, I don't know. King H, King H too. Black did nothing. What is your next move? Oh, so this king is, can just walk around oh, and just yeah. walk all the way. The king, yeah, the G, the G5. And black yeah. can't do anything. And the king is just coming in on these dark squares. It's it's a fantastic idea. Yeah, that, is, which... that is so insane. It's yeah. like he, he, he's, he's inviting himself with tea. Yeah, no. The, this game, they always call it, I think it's called a short king walk. It's a funny joke based on the guy playing white being called short. But black doesn't do anything. And it's funny. He just puts the rook back here. The king comes to f4. Then he attacks the rook, and then the king just comes to g5, and he resigned. His king h6 is coming, and this is mate, which it's just such an incredible game. Denise Boa mentioned this in her lecture last week, and it's also one of my favorite games because it's not a concept you're going to look for, and there's very few situations where you can use your king in the middle game, but it's just amazing to see that creative idea. And again, all these grandmasters see that when their pieces are more active and their opponent has no active plan, they find the one way, they find all the ways that they can make their position better before they attack. Yo, white knew, okay, he's been playing the whole game to get this king weak. I'm sure he looked at this position and was like, I really want a dark sweat bishop so I can mate. And then he was like, I don't have a dark sweat bishop. Then he wanted to get his rooks and his rooks can't help on the dark square. The knight can't move. And he... There's probably a moment in his head where he was just like, oh, wait, I can bring the king up. Which, it's just an incredible idea. I don't know if anyone I would else... Have never, no. I would never thought of uh, bringing my king there. No, you would not. <laughs> like, you, you'd be crazy to think of this. But the level of calculation, and once you see king h2 and then you see king g3, you're like, wait, there's nothing that's stopping this. Which, it's a really fantastic game that probably it's happens once the, in a lifetime yeah it's true what they say there's possibility in, in madness no? yeah no i mean now i'd probably encourage you and you're just gonna have your king on e4 and like move seven and you're gonna get checkmated and then like complain that my leg show is bad or something but this is calculation like he sees that his king is he gets the imagination for the idea by just looking to improve his position as much as possible so when you're playing and you have your opponent in a grip don't just play some random sacrifice that might or might not work. Make your position as good as possible so that then eventually either your opponent's going to hang himself trying to do something or your position's just so good you can play that sacrifice later and it will just work better. So, yeah, I hope you people learned something. Are there any questions or comments left? I unfortunately didn't have time to go through this last game I would have liked to. If you people have time in the week i would thoroughly recommend you check it out let me post the link in the chat here to the leech study this game between petrosian and john peters yeah let me just make it that everyone can clone the study it's a fantastic game with another very creative idea played of his king the first two games we looked at were more just standard games where you activated your king and then i wanted these last two to actually properly inspire people to do great things but okay, thank you everyone for coming. If there's no more questions, comments, or announcements, I suppose we shall call it for an evening then. Yeah, no, no announcements, Michael. Um, okay. But 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 Darren needs to um, play the qualifiers. He missed out in three positions on Saturday, so he he said that you must help him now. <laughs> no, okay. no, he's welcome. So, to... so, so, so we've, we, 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 we've, we've agreed that I don't, if you've got time on, on Friday, he's, he's finishing up early on Friday. I think he just needs some, 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 some match practice also um, yeah. um, uh, so that he actually ready on Saturday. Okay. Is that happening this Saturday? Yes, yes. Okay, no, we can Those definitely. Qualifiers. That will be good. Okay, nobody... I was playing these qualifiers. It's only only for the youth, um. So. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. No, that's good. I'll definitely have a chat with him and arrange things. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, he's writing exams now during the week until 
well, I think until Friday morning. So uh, let's see. Yeah. No, exams first, chess second. Yeah. I don't want to end up like me. I have assignments I need to have done by Tuesday, and I'm procrastinating it till the weekend to do chess stuff rather. But hey, okay. Mm, I think that's everything covered. No other questions? Thank you, Burton. Yes, yeah, that's, that's good. The session thanks, uh, Michael. Is, I think I would adapt uh, this game to my one of my favorites. Thanks for.